Well, okay, well, let's begin. Well, good morning and welcome to a new episode of Presenting Our Presence Pop, which is a vodcast hosted by Dr. Florence Blanfield and myself, Cindy Cadet. And uh, today we are so happy to be having a guest, Marilyn Dumont, with us. And just to remind ourselves um, and myself that POP is really a, a about highlighting the ways in which Indigenous people have contributed and continue to contribute. And so grateful, Marilyn, that you accepted our invitation to be with us today. And so I'll pass it to you. You want to introduce yourself in a way that's meaningful to you and then we can move into kind of conversations about you know you and i were visiting uh this week and i realized how long you've been at the u of a in so many different roles it's like wow oh my goodness what a celebration of that you know yeah well my name is marilyn dumont i'm a writer and i've been writing and publishing since the 80s and uh, I'm also associate professor, cross-appointed with um, English and Film Studies and Native Studies at the University of Alberta. Yeah, well, I started out in, what year was that, 1984, when I moved up to Edmonton to continue my undergraduate degree. And, and then in 1984, Five, I started working as the academic advisor for the Native Student Services, which I worked there until 1991, and I was the coordinator of the transition year program. Um, at the same time, I was teaching uh, a non-credit course in Indigenous women's poetry because I was reading it and writing it, and I thought, well, I just want to do this. And it was non-credit, and it was offered through the Faculty of Extension and the English department had no Indigenous literary courses, zero. So I had grad students from the English department come over and take my non-credit course in Indigenous women's poetry because there was nothing in the English department. Um, I then, uh, let's see, 1991, I left the university. Uh, I went to uh, do my master's. Well, I did some work in film film production for two years. Um, and then I went to do my master's and then I was invited back to the U of A as the writer in residence in the year 2000. And then I've taught like sessional pretty much ever since then. Um, and then I was hired in 2016. So yeah, I've, <laughs> I've been here a long time at the university. Um, and you know, when I tell students that it's like, what? You old dinosaur, what are you doing still here? Um, so, yeah, so that's that's how I'm at the U of A, and here I am, still here. Uh, still here. here. Oh, so wonderful. And, and you're working now in the, in the, Engl in the English department, mm -hmm. and you're doing all this incredible research on f family stories and story mapping and bringing light, and making that visible, because... One big piece of um, that we realized through Florence's tease during COVID is that becoming visible to one another as Indigenous colleagues. Yeah. Right? It's like, wow. And then yeah. make visible the work that we're doing and yeah. then how we can continue to invest in that, um, continue right. to invest in that and learn from each other's, from each other's research and be inspired. Mm -hmm. I'm so inspired by the work you've done with that whole story mapping and wow. yeah, tell us well, how that came to be a little bit. Well, it started, I mean, it's probably started 40 years ago. I mean, really it was when I thought about my search to find out who I am and where I am, um, it began long, many, many years ago and it began with writing. But then as, you know, the years progressed and stuff, and I saw a story map, I thought, hey, I think this would be a really good idea to try to map out all of the Dumont men. Um, and I chose the men because they're the ones who are in the archives and they're easy to follow their names. So <clears throat> I chose that first of all. And then, but I also thought about my nieces and nephews. And at 66 years old, I'm 
finally getting a fuller sense of who I am and where I'm from. And so I thought, I want to make sure that my nieces and nephews know that before they're 66 years old. I want them to know that when they're growing up, when they're teens. Um, so, <clears throat> so I thought, well, I need to find some medium that's really going to engage them. Uh, and so I, when I saw the story map, I thought, perfect, this is, this is going to work really well because it's so visual and there's maps and it's interactive. So um, Emily Haynes, who's, who really did all the work on this, I didn't do this work at all. It was Emily Haynes who did it and she's an amazing grad student. Um, but she was able, with all of her skills, she was able to pull this together for me to see it, to finally see it. And so I'm just going to read a little bit about what I've done in terms of preparation of this, presenting this before, because it's very long and, you know, people aren't going to read through slide by slide with me. So I just wanted to present something else. Um, so I asked myself, what does it mean? when I say that I'm in Alberta. What does that mean? So I chose to document the paternal lines in my family. Um, we looked at land holdings or territories that they might have traveled over. Um, and it's my belief, and I have to do more work on this, that the Métis um, basically experience this thing called traumatic forgetting. And it's a symptom of generations of Métis families being displaced from their land over and over and over and over. So I asked myself, what does it mean when I say I'm, I'm in Alberta? At 66, I've been able to map out my paternal Dumont ancestry back five generations. And now I have a visual concept of what territories my ancestors traveled, hunted, or lived on. Um, and it's altered the way I perceive myself on this territory. And in fact, the way I perceive the territory at all. Um, because my family has been on this land longer than the province of Alberta has existed. Um, first of all, we confirm the genealogical information and then we looked for homestead records, script records, any documented employment uh, with the forts or uh, fur trading companies uh, from the paternal Dumont ancestors. So 1700s, uh, the first and oldest generation, Jean-Baptiste Dumont, traveled from Whitehorse Plain in Manitoba and signed on as a free trader with Edmonton House in 1790. And later uh, also with Fort Carlton and Fort Pitt. Alberta becomes a province in 1905. In the 1800s, the second generation, Gabriel Dumont, nephew of the famous, was born in Rocky Mountain House and the only one of Jean-Baptiste's offspring not to marry a La Frambois. And good reason for that, because they married into other family lines in the area that made stronger, um, stronger alliances. And so these early relatives of mine were in Buffalo brigades that moved more than they settled. And, and that to me just kind of, it's like, what? I mean, they just kept moving. <laughs> it was like, what, they never stopped? Um, and so these brigades um, were made up of extended family units, um, some as large as like 300 people, and they would go to these Evernot sites, um, Tail Creek, Buffalo Lake, Big Valley, Lac St. Anne. They spoke French, but they preferred Cree. And they hunted for Fort Edmonton, Rocky Mountain House, Fort Pitt, and Fort Carlton. So they supplied those uh, those sites with buffalo, with buffalo meat. Alberta becomes a province in 1905. 1830 to 1870, the third generation, uh, 
Elisir, Jacques Elisir lived in Duhamel. And I have a sense he was the first kind of rooted or settled uh, relative. And Duhamel is uh, 100 kilometers uh, southeast of Edmonton, uh, 12 miles southwest of Camrose. And it was a Hudson's Bay uh, trading post. Um, and they used the, uh, there was a fjord at Battle River that they used at that point. Uh, it was a large Métis community, uh, Duhamel was. And in fact, uh, in the church there, there's still some records I would like to look at. But um, so Ilizir and his wife both died of smallpox at Duhamel, Alberta Crumbs province in 1905, 1859. Uh, to late 1800s, early 1900s, the fourth generation, Timote or Timothy, Chimodi is what uh, the, how the Creek people uh, pronounced it, Chimodi, was my chapan, um, a great grandfather, and he applied for script on behalf of his son, my Mushum, Saint Pierre Dumont. But Timote's land, uh, which he fought for his entire life and only secured a uh, title for four years before he died. Um, he lost his land in the McDougal and Secord uh, Hall on Métis script, uh, which made them millionaires. Um, and so we lost that land in St. Paul de Métis. 1885 to 1955, the fifth generation, Saint Pierre Dumont, my Muslim, had homestead that they moved off of to Kikino Métis settlement, where he was awarded a lot, but he never stayed. 1917 to 1992, Ambrose Dumont, my father. My parents moved from Lac La Biche in the early 1940s with two other Métis families in the back of a three-ton truck. The men harvested crops on settler farms to earn money to get to the next town until we made it to Sundry, Alberta and to Road Allowance. So what I learned in this whole process, that my initial search for land tenure was misguided by settler oriented concepts about land. Therefore, I would have been overlooking my own ancestors by looking for settlement. Settlement was something unfamiliar and undesirable to them and to many in the Buffalo Brigades who were members of my family. And they were hunting in the 1800s in Alberta. And Arthur Ray argues that the historiography of the Métis has been settlement oriented. And Heather Devine indicates that most documentary sources were created by outsiders whose recordings of events was influenced by their own economic preoccupations and cultural biases. In these writings, the lives of the working class of the fur trade or the Buffalo Brigades were almost always invisible. Um, and Brenda McDougall reminds us about the Buffalo Brigades. These were people who lived in family-based economic units and spent their lives in a continuous cycle of movement that's alien to us today. So this settler oriented bias that I had coupled with generations of land dispossession, script corruption, obfuscation, homestead abandonment and poverty left my family as squatters on land we moved across um, in the Buffalo, seasonal Buffalo Brigades uh, in the mid-1800s, before Alberta was a province. <clears throat> so now I have another understanding about how my own um, history has been shaped by misleading historiography. Um, the Trottier Brigades uh, were at Whitehorse Plains, but they began wintering farther west by the 1850s. And McDougall argues that the Métis in Red River were not the first out on the plains. Instead, they joined other Métis who had made the plains their home since the early 1800s. So this historiography that always places us back at Red River is actually incorrect. 
Alberta was a prime Buffalo Brigade area that had several Buffalo Brigades. Um, the Piche or Pisu group, and off of there grew the Dumont Brigade and probably other brigades too, Willette Brigade, all of these brigades that were operating in the province. Um, <clears throat> So my own reading about my own family has been misleading. Um, yeah. So yeah. So this this whole visual aid has really helped me kind of restructure <laughs> my whole frame of reference about where I'm from. Um, not that I didn't know it before, but I think the visual aid in this research and closer look at the historical time periods informs a different part of my brain. And I'm, it's pretty clear to me now that my family's territory became increasingly controlled by settler colonialism until my family was reduced and we were forced to take homestead or scrip. And then that was taken away from us by various means. My parents never spoke nostalgically about where they were from. 60 years hence, their desire to revisit the places they fled was only mentioned because of the familial connections still there. But where they came from and how, or so, but where we came from and how we got to road allowance and sundry was something I thought a lot about, but I didn't know how to find answers to. But in my own oversight in not re researching my family territory was also about a story that was supposed to be left behind. That story was not to be picked up and carried to the next place, like so many things the Métis carried. You know, they carried their fiddles, they carried their doors, they carried their, you know, everything. This story was not to be carried. The stories we did not carry were supposed to be obscured by our education and socialization in the nation state of Canada. We forgot where our territories were, just as the nation state didn't acknowledge our way of life because we eschewed settlement and we therefore became ghosts on our own land because our way of life was not recognized or awarded. So my conceptualization of this now um, has been really aided by this visual information. And I know now that I am not in Alberta, but that Alberta is clearly on the land of my Métis ancestors and Treaty 6 relatives. So many pieces to threads to pick up on that and um, it's helping me also in that search within the context of Saskatchewan because I'm also working with visual aids and there's something that when you begin to see the images something starts to yes. shift I know like these and, uh, these images that I had of the maps it's like what the hell why didn't I know that? Yeah. Like, and one of the things that my, we must have had some kind of connection back to Rocky Mountain House mm -hmm. because my older brothers and sisters told me, like when I told them about this Gabriel Dumont being born at Rocky Mountain House, they said, oh, that's why dad used to go there and play hand games. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. these things start coming back. It's like, so we had a connection to Rocky Mountain House. I never liked Rocky Mountain House. I actually hated it. It was just like, a, it just gave me the creeps when I went there. But uh, apparently that's that's one of the areas that was, um, you know, part of the territory in my family. Well, and what would have changed within that area also, like you said about the settler bias, oh. how the, the lens. Yeah. 
and how that yeah. story was not meant how you know when you said how that story was not meant to be carried and oh. then how you're picking it up right yeah how important it is and I've just been starting to dig into uh, Brenda McDougall's research and then Cheryl Troop's research on how the Buffalo Brigades were organized and then I'm finding my own family names within that. I'm, I'm looking at it from the lens of the role of the women within those brigades because they speak about that they would have been organized as sister communities. Absolutely. When I think about, yeah, so the health from my lens of how do we reconstitute our mm -hmm. health and well-being and of course picking up those stories are part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what I would love to see? I would love to see 10, 12 of these maps so that when people looked at it, they went, oh my God, the Métis really were here. Look at this. Look at, look at this map. They were really here. Yeah. You know? Look, that's what I would love to see. Um, I would like to see other people do it on their family so that we could have a whole group of these. Yes. And it's undeniable, undeniable. Our presence was undeniable in these maps. Mm. I mean, the fact that, you know, these Buffalo Brigades were supplying the forts, that was the reason why the forts could exist, right? <laughs> Buffalo Brigades were bringing them meat all the time and, you know, so it's um, really, it really gives me a different sense of who I am and where I'm at. And boy, now I, now when people say, you know, where are you from? It's like, I'm from a place Alberta. called Alberta, but it was, we were here before Alberta was a province. Yeah. And it's so encouraging to, when you say at 66, you got it, you know, it's like, yeah. ah. You always knew, but there's something inside. And so for me, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Because it's like, when am I going to get there? It's like, okay, it's, it's, you know, when am I going to get there? And the, the, the motivation for me was also like my nephews and nieces, because, you know, I don't have my children of my own, but they're my, Ooh, yeah. You know, and it was 30 years ago when a teacher said to me, your niece told me today, that she has a secret. And I said, oh, well, what did she say her secret was? And the secret was she was Métis. And I said, no more. And that was oh, it, something God. inside of me. And then and then my master's and my work was all about really shifting that, um, shifting that secret. Like you said, the stories that we could not, Carry that had on. to stay, stay buried, how you yeah. said it there, that it couldn't be what we carried with us. No. And I think, I mean, a lot of that was grief, right? I mean, but in some ways it was kind of hidden grief too, because my parents carried it from their parents who carried it. And it's all this kind of grief that's underneath. And it's, it has to do with land and attachment to land and our disconnection from it. And I think what happens too is that the individuals then begin blaming themselves you know right it's like what's wrong with those half breed they don't even have any land right well we tried <laughs> we really tried but uh yeah so you know and the fact that uh, we moved on to road allowance in sundry alberta and there were probably like my sister doreen did did research on this and i think she found about 30 metis families it's like at the time, it felt like there were five or six, but I guess there were about 30 of us there, 30 families. And uh, yeah. 30 with 10 children would have would have meant 300 would have been a whole community. Yeah. yeah. And for each other, right? Yes, absolutely. And when my dad, when we moved on to that road allowance, it was just little shacks, right? And uh, somebody tried to burn our little shack down. And so uh, what my dad did is he bought an old schoolhouse and he skid that into town and it was just plopped up on blocks in the middle of this field from these people that were, you know, were friendly with my dad. And it sat there for years, no water, no toilet, nothing. It just sat there uh, until my dad bought land in town and then we skid the, the old schoolhouse there. But 
yeah, I mean, people wanted to get rid of us. They, they didn't want us there on the road lounge. And like Sophie said, nothing can bring us down. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It's that true. generation and still oh. joyful and still, you know, I was talking with my students this week. I finished my class with remembering the, the beauty and the strength of our women. I had a picture of mom and Sophie. Like, look at these two women, 85 and 93. They're dancing. They're doing the jig together and they're full of smiles. It's like, ah, also part of what we carry, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and um, thank goodness for my mother because she she fought tooth and nail for us, for sure. you know, to get um, to go to school, and because we weren't living on because we were living on road allowance, not paying tax, they didn't want uh, my older brothers and sisters to go to school. But my mother fought with them, and finally they let them in, but they were sat in the back with coloring books. Jesus, I didn't realize that that that's why they. Road, if you lived on the road allowance, you were denied school because you weren't paying tax. I didn't know that that was the connection. Oh my goodness. And in Alberta at the time, likely, there were all of these small, small school divisions. Yeah. So like in the, um, there would be one organized around perhaps a church or one organized around a community but there were these small school divisions. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't even part of that community, in addition to not paying tax, if you didn't go to that church or you didn't, yeah. you wouldn't be um, seen as being part of being able to go to school. Right, right. Yeah. And you're right, the taxes, you weren't contributing, therefore you weren't eligible for the, the education. Yeah. I love hearing the story, Marilyn, about your family. And I I think so much about the way, where's our, um, I too am from Alberta, Métis. And, you know, I'm thinking about when I used to try and understand that my grandfather and my great grandmother, people that I grew up with, right? They were born in this place we now called Alberta before it was Alberta. And so I really love the way that you're describing this, where are you from mm -hmm. and your family connections, because it helps me to learn about how to name how I am from this place. Yeah, absolutely. But prior to it being known as Alberta. Yeah. So what part of the province? We, well, it's interesting because um, most the settlement happened for the family line that I'm from is in Fort Chippewan. Oh, okay. But we were, um, they were, my ancestors were working with the Hudson Bay Company primarily and Fort Edmonton, Jasper House, okay. Slave Lake, right, Lac yep. St. Anne. Mm -hmm. Then somehow, and now I, I need to try and figure out the story. You know, they they were they went to Fort Chippewan. And so my great great grandparents settled in Fort Chippewan somehow. Mm -hmm. And it might have been because there was a Scottish influence and there were other Scottish Metis in the area. Mm -hmm. Not sure, but yeah. So then from that, my great great grandparents line is where now we have the interconnectedness with Fort Chippewan. Okay, I'm thinking of names like uh, Mackay and what other names would be? Fraser. Oh yes. Luditz. Right. Wileys. Yeah. Okay. And interconnected family names of O'Flett. Yes. Okay. Um, the um, and then relationships with Mercury and uh, Lapine. Yeah. So then that whole so my you know my great grandmother's generation then and my grandparents generation sort of in the northeastern part of the province but we have the ties to fort edmonton yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. jasper house 
Yeah, I love hearing those names. My mom's story is actually very interesting too. We didn't know anything about my mom's history. Uh, she's a Dufresne, uh, related to Francois Dufresne, who was taken hostage at Frog Lake. Uh, and he is the illegitimate child of Chief Factor Rowan. Yeah, so interesting, right? And um, and we didn't, uh, well, we didn't know any of this until about five years ago and I ran into it reading something. I was like, what? Dufresne? And uh, yeah, so, and my I don't even know if my mom knew that much about it. I don't think she did, actually. She didn't know where Francois came from. But yeah, he was the Ill illegitimate child of Chief Factor Rowan. But he was taken on by Edward Dufresne, who was the Frenchman. And uh, raised him with, uh, I think, a Métis wife. Um, but yeah, it's you know, it's so interesting how we're connected to this place and we don't even know it. It's so interesting, and I like the piece when you speak about the mobility. How you didn't, re how when you realize how they would have kept moving. Yeah. And so when you think about Florence, the birth, how it's like, oh, they would have kept moving and. Oh, mm -hmm. well, wow, I just want to acknowledge all that beautiful work that you're doing and it's helping us, for sure, me, myself, and I'm sure those who are listening with us, the importance of making those connections yeah. and how it then shifts what we've internalized or socialized, been socialized by thinking about who we are and, and how we come to be to that, to places and how we come to be in those relationships. Absolutely. I mean, here I had this view, was just totally influenced by the settler colonial idea of, of land, land ownership, of the Métis. It was, it was all, until I saw these maps, I was like, oh my God. Like, and, and then look at the dates, like 1905, you know, for the province, it's like, there's a lot here that was not seen or acknowledged. Um, and then realizing too, reading uh, Brenda McDougal, who says that, you know, the, the Red River Métis were not the first out into the plains. In fact, they joined people who were already out there. And so this idea of historiography, always going back to Red River, it's mistaken. Because we had, we had our own culture right here, thriving, you know? And um, you're reminding me, Brenda, when she spoke one time, she says, as thinking about many places we call home. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of speaking about that once at, at um, one of the talks she gave. And I, that really struck me. It's like, ah, there are many places as Métis people that we call home. Mm -hmm. And so challenging that, that red river narrative as the only place we can kind of make those linkages to and so when you think of and that's really shifted in my thinking in terms of coming from uh the area of south saskatchewan yeah and thinking about oh this is now i can actually call this place home because we were five generations who lived and th mm -hmm. thrived and and then now I'm curious to know because my grandmother's a Lapine, so you know, where did that yeah, my grandmother's a Lapine. Relate the you know, related to Maxime Lapine and Ambroise Lapine, and of course they're written about mm -hmm. about in the historical narratives. And I'm always yeah, I'll have to think about thinking about both like you've done with the patrilineal line and the matrilineal, like yeah. thinking through that. So yeah. Well, and also, I mean, I know that, you know, males are always tracked more in terms of archival stuff, but also um, Keisha Supernault kept telling me, Marilyn, you have relatives all over this province. She kept telling me that, right? And um, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, now I know. So it's, yeah. But how long it's taken me to do this? Like, why, 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 why? Does an individual have to go through all that work to celebrate their Métis identity? I mean, not that I didn't celebrate it before, but now I really know more information. So 
And I didn't want any of my nieces and nephews to have to go through that. So Marilyn, I've come to a way to think about that. It's because our ancestors, and I'm thinking about, you know, like I'm, I was so lucky. I knew my grandmother siblings, my grandfather's siblings. I knew my great grandmother. I knew their, my grandparents' aunties. And like, I got a chance to meet some of them, but you know, they were busy living yeah. and they didn't, we didn't, we weren't curious about those stories at the time, no. you know, and I remember an, a, a brother of my grandfather who was kind of the family storyteller. And every time he would visit, he'd always have pieces of history for me. Mm -hmm. But as I was growing up, it didn't. And for my mother, right, he would always be telling the stories. He would travel across Canada. He would connect all of the his nieces and nephews and his great nieces and nephews. And we never knew one another, but he was the family weaver in a way of our stories. But as he got older, he kept sending me stuff he had written. And just a few years ago, I found that envelope. I had kept it all together, right? And I thought, oh my gosh, he was also part of the family historian. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is that they just were living. So they didn't yeah. have time. No. And we didn't, weren't interested in. So as we develop a sense of our identity ourselves, we have to go searching. And yes. we are lucky because we have access to so much more information now. Oh, I know. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And um, yeah, so grateful that that this opportunity came to me to use this and to have the help of Emily and the funding from Métis Kinscapes and, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have wouldn't have had this.